Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna, founder of SIBO SOS. And remember, the SOS has come to mean save ourselves. Always work with a practitioner who knows what they're doing. And I'm here with, speaking of practitioner, who knows what he's doing, Steve Wright. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited. It's, it's Monday. I'm full of energy. Let's do this. Cool. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Me too. So what we're going to talk about today is how to address these bloating and underlying issues of bloating. And there's distension. That's also sort of the medical term for it. But what I want to do is have Steve take us through um, his approach. And if you don't know who Steve is, He's somebody who I've trusted for so long, thank goodness, that I've known you for this long. Steve helped me when I told him I had a dream about sharing um, information that I had learned about SIBO. He was in the phase of his career where he was training people like me. And so he was there before the first SIBO SOS Summit uh, in 2017 and the second SIBO SOS Summit in 2017. And Steve has um, an incredible history of educating people about gut health. His website and his platform um, was SCD Lifestyle, Specific Carbohydrate Diet Lifestyle, but then it got into leaky gut and on and on, and then they trained practitioners. Now, the other thing about Steve, he has his own personal story, and also he never wanted to develop his own supplements. He has done that because he couldn't find what he wanted in the marketplace, and I know a lot of you have used them. Um, so I love hearing what's so different about what Steve does. Okay, thank you all for letting me know where you're from. And it's so good to have you here, Steve. Oh, by the way, Steve's an engineer by training. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, see how this all works out. All right, Steve, right. Take it over. What are you, what are you thinking about for bloating these days? Well, bloating, I mean, let's just start at the, at the highest level and maybe either help some people normalize their experiences or uh, understand their experiences, because I think there's maybe some confusion, like for instance, you're not supposed to have any gas. Like there's like an ideal out there. Like I don't, you know, I don't ever want to make gas. And that's, that's actually not healthy. Um, they've done a lot of research on this and like a normal healthy human uh, will still fart like five to five to 14 times a day. And so this idea that like, you should never make gas or no, no gas is, is just, um, number one, not something you want to shoot for. That's not actually healthy. And number two, it's, it's a fantasy. And so let's start there. And then let's be really real that, you know, I used to have bloating and, uh, visceral hypersensitivity so bad that it didn't matter if I ate a burger or if I had chicken and lettuce, I would, I would basically like swell up my, my body would descend my, my stomach area. And then I would basically cry because it was so painful back then. I wasn't um, aware of my emotions and I wasn't integrated enough as a man. So I would just say like my, my eyes were leaking, but I was, I was definitely crying and I didn't really have any options. And so if, if you're someone right now who does have visceral hypersensitivity, which we'll go into in a minute, um, and you're someone who's bloats up and, and you have to like undo your pants or something like, trust me, I've, I have been there. I don't know your exact version of it, but I have my own story that, that was, you know, essentially almost got me fired. So bloating is like a day stopper, you know, when it happens, uh, at least for me anyways, if it, if it happens, I can't think about anything else. Like I just want it to go away. And so I think when it comes to bloating, number one is how do we get to where you have hope that this can go away? And number two, you can make it go away yourself. And then number three, you can focus on why is it happening in the first place? Because there's all this talk about root causes and, and potentially even SIBO being your root cause. But if you're dealing with the day-to-day -day pain of, of bloating or visceral hypersensitivity, and you don't feel like you have any control over it, it can be so hard to, you know, just press forward with, with even focusing on SIBO. And of course, SIBO is caused by something else. So it's this whole cascade. And it's um, really a feeling of being out of control. That That's the way I experienced it, of this like something is going on. It'd be like if someone was breaking into my house and I knew they were there, but I didn't know how to like call the police or something. That's a scary thought. So um, that's the way I felt about it. I, I, I'm i sure, can you all relate? Just pop in the chat if you can relate to that. So. We're talking about the problem and also we're going to define what visceral hypersensitivity is because there is a that's a medical term and you may have it and not even know it because it's very rare that like a doctor's gonna 
you know, diagnose you with that. But let's talk about point number one, as promised, how to manage bloating before it starts. Is it possible, Steve? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, th I think it is. Uh, it, it's a combination of dietary changes and supplements. Like that's, you know, and you could say like, I'm biased because I'm coming from a, a supplement company and sure I am biased, but I've also dealt with this with myself and like hundreds of other people for over 10 years. So uh, the only way to go through this in, in the short term is dietary changes and supplemental changes to help you manage that. But I do believe, and what I've seen is that if you can use those changes to get out of pain, you will feel empowered to take the next step, which is to figure out what's going on. And so I, I want to deliver hope today. I want to deliver practical applications that people can use today. Um, and, and we're going to dive deeper into that. So we're talking about digestive enzymes and some other um, products and just some other supplements that you may already have at home. Um, what's the, so before we get into that, what's the difference between distension and bloating? Yeah, so, I mean, some people's uh, body cavities will distend out uh, after they eat or due to some normal fermentation after a meal. Uh, it's, it's when it gets like painful or again, your clothes stop fitting or you have, uh, you know, other uncontrollable issues, whether that be uh, related pain or, or like tachycardia or something like that, that it, it becomes a real issue. And so again, the goal is not to like have a body that like uh, never ferments something. That's not like the microbiome is supposed to ferment things. You have bugs everywhere on your skin. So there is going to be a little bit of a movement in your body and your cavity after you eat it, a little distension. Um, the bloating is when we, it becomes like a painful for your life, you know, something. Right. So that's, that's the biggest thing. And then that rolls us into visceral hypersensitivity, which is basically 30 to 60%. The research is really unclear at this point. That's just the range of research studies that I've found um, of people with IBS or bloating report pain from that distension or that movement of the, of the cavity out, usually the small intestine. And that's called visceral hypersensitivity. So if, if you're on this call, you know, you already have a higher chance of being like higher than, than probably the 30%. So I would, I would wager say like at least probably 50% of people on this call right now, just due to selection bias, probably have some version of visceral hypersensitivity at the extreme end that feels, at least for me, that felt like knives in my gut. Like I would have days where I was a non-functioning human. I would go crawl into bed and it just, I would, I mean, I would think about death even because it was so painful. Like, I wonder if it's better, uh, you know, if that's the only way to get rid of this. Um, on, the, on the mild end, it's, you know, it's just really annoying and you think about it all day. So visceral hypersensitivity is very real. It is very connected to your gut as well as your brain. Um, and as someone who suffered with it for many years and now, I mean, maybe it happens once a year. Um, I really don't believe I really am affected by it. I, I can get bloated, but I don't have the pain anymore. And so there is hope you can get rid of it. Um, I believe not everybody, of course, and not medical advice, but um, I think there is a path. Okay, so let's talk about the, the, so we're nine minutes in, we've talked about the problem. I wanna get into the solutions because that's what everybody's here for. So um, when I just wanna throw out a couple of things that when we're talking about how to manage the bloat before it starts, Dr. Pimentel tells this story about how he had a client, a patient and he went out to lunch with this patient and they couldn't figure out why he was so bloated beforehand. But after eating this meal with him, he understood why this gentleman was so bloated because he ate with his mouth open and so much air was coming in while he was talking and chewing and all of that. So that is something that I don't think we talk enough about. That is a possibility for you, um, for any of us. So just keep that in mind that that's one thing that um, was, you know, an unexpected source of bloating. Then- yeah. You know, right? So, so remember the diet manages your symptoms in this overgrowth scenario. And we're all looking at, you know, SCD, um, GAPS, SIBO specific food guide from Dr. Allison Seebecker, Dr. Pimentel's low fermentation diet. We're all looking to lower the fermentable load. That's that low FODMAP, right? We're trying to lower the fermentable load. 
one of the ways that I do it is by using holozymes. You, you may have digestive enzymes at home that you've just been like, Ugh, it's not a prescription. It's not going to help me. Talk to us about digestive enzymes, if you would, because that I believe is easy. Obviously, it's, it's, it's you know, it's common. And I think sometimes we overlook it, Steve, because it seems like too easy. Yeah, well, let's let's circle back to some other root causes after we talk about enzymes, um, okay. because there, you know, the, there are these underlying assumptions like gulping air. Um, yeah. Some people who are athletes might uh, recognize that they have gas after an athletic performance because they're doing the same thing. So, oh, interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, there is there are some really cool uh, just individual things you can notice and journal about, uh, and one of those things, quite frankly, is enzymes. I mean your gut, think of your sort of like the process in your gut, sort of like the TSA going into the airport. Um, there are so many ways to uh, detect bad things and keep them out of, out of your body. So, you know, it, the TSA has screeners and dogs and, and uh, I don't know, machines that check us and people that pat us down all kinds of layers of security and your gut has a lot of things like that as well and one of the things that your gut is um just unwilling to do is accept foods that are not broken down to the right size of molecule like it's it's just it's like go no go there's no gray zone here it, it if it's not the right size molecule the gut it won't go across the gut wall and then if it doesn't go across the gut wall that means that the bacteria or the fungi or whatever get to have a party with it. They get to eat their birthday cake and make a bunch of gas. And so what do enzymes do? Enzymes cut the molecules, especially the carbohydrates, which are the most fermentable, down to the right sizes so you can absorb them right away and not have that higher fermentation potential. So there's this hyper focus right now on, like you said, you mentioned like five or six diets already on this one talk and we we're like, what, 12 minutes in or something. Yeah. Right. So if diets were the only answer, we would have already found it. We don't need another classification of how much fermentation there is. That's in my opinion, as an engineer and as math and first principles based, that's a law of diminishing returns. If you're already on one of these diets, uh, the, the, the Pimentel diet, the Seebecker diet, uh, low FODMAPs, C SED, anything like that. That's like a super advanced diet. Like you're already at the bleeding edge of lowering your fermentation potential. And if it's not working, then you have to make a change if you want it to go away. And I think enzymes would be the first place to go because the fundamental fact is that bloating is extra gas. Extra gas only comes from bugs eating food that you should have eaten or absorbed basically. And so enzymes can be really lacking due to all kinds of things. It could be your age. It could be your nervous system being too stressed. It could be that your stomach acid is off. There's a, you could have inflammation at the, you know, if you're a celiac or, or your, your non-gluten um, sensitivity and you have damage at the villi level in the small intestine, you're not going to have brush border enzymes. And so you have um, almost an infinite number of ways to, to reduce your enzyme potential. And then you also have pancreatic enzymes, brush water enzymes, and microbiome enzymes. And so depending on what level you may have, a, like maybe your, your pancreatic enzymes are good, but your microbiome is, is messed up due to antibiotic usage in the past, you're going to struggle even if you're eating the lowest fermentation potential diet out there. And so just helping your body out is a really good idea and using a product that's going to cover all three of those areas is, is the answer. And if you want to know why diets tend to work, it's because they're, they're, all of these diets are essentially compensating for the fact that you can't break down these, these different types of carbohydrates that a normal healthy human can't. FODMAPs are not toxic. They're not literally, they're, they don't cause cancer. They're not going to destroy your brain. They're not, they're not even in, like if gluten is like the the enemy, if, it's, if, right. if you consider gluten and seed oils the worst, FODMAPs are so benign sure. compared to them. And so that means a, a, a healthy gut, any, any healthy human gut should be able to break those down. And so if it's not happening, that's a clue that, that the underlying mechanical nature of your body is not working properly. The, the number one link there is enzymes um, because all of those FODMAPs start off as these giant 
complex carbohydrate, not all of them, except for the sugar alcohols and polyols, but all the other ones we, that we eat most of, and we have to cut those, they have to cut those links up. And that's what happens at the pancreatic enzyme level, the brush border enzyme level, and then um, the microbiome level. And if you get that right, you know, FODMAPs don't have to be an issue for you. Again, they're not toxic. Sorbitol is not the enemy. <laughs> no, it's so true. And we can definitely get into that mindset of we're like food bad. And, and I'm bad because I ate food. I don't want anyone to experience that. I certainly have felt that before. So there's starch bloat or sugar bloat or veggie bloat. And I think that ties in. And then we've got a couple of questions. Um, so what is the difference? And also, can you do me a favor and remind me, because I always forget about like the names of the enzymes, protease, lipase, and what they do. I mean, I remember and then I forget. Yeah, yeah. So- so we'll do them in tandem. Let's do them in tandem. Okay. okay. So um, polysaccharide is a complex carbohydrate. This is everything from your vegetables to your grains to um, starches. They all contain polysaccharides. Poly just means many bonds. So polysaccharide just means many bonds of carbohydrates or many bonds of sugars, actually. So amylase is a pancreatic enzyme. Someone mentioned Creon. I just saw it pop up in the chat. Creon is a, is a prescription pancreatic insufficiency drug that contains only pancreatic enzymes. So it contains a lot of amylase. The other two pancreatic enzymes are protease for protein and lipase for fat. So amylase is like the workhorse for polysaccharides. And, and, and again, this is vegetable, any vegetable you eat, this is, um, your, all your starches, 100% of your starches, all of your grains, amylase has to go in there and do a lot of work. And it begins to, to cleave the, the structures down. So they're smaller and smaller and smaller, such that then you can go to your brush border. And again, amylase drops in right at the bottom of the, the, the stomach and the small intestine, right where it transitions. And then your brush border is a little bit farther down. So the hope is that you cut it down a little bit. And then now at your brush border, uh, you release um, enzymes that are really important for um, sugar bloat. And so those are things like maltase, um, lactase, which is uh, the sugar in milk that a lot of people have a problem with, um, invertase. And, and so this helps break down, for instance, like sucrose. Sucrose is not necessarily bad. It's found in all the fruits, almost in nature, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's two sugars bonded. It's, and, and we have to break that bond so we can absorb them. And so a lot of the diets, like the specific carbohydrate diet, why does it work? Well, it eliminates the majority, like 99% of all those polysaccharides. So if you have an amylase issue, you're, you're much better off. And then it eliminates most of the brush border um, sucrose issues. So then it's mostly just fructose and glucose, and you can just absorb it. And that is why that diet, I believe, works so effectively for, for many individuals. And, I, and the other diets are a similar version of that. Um, after that, you have your microbiome enzymes. And this is where um, the FODMAPs get even more complex and where these different types of bloats come in. So it is really cool if you can journal and go slow enough, because I think slow and, and curiosity are, the, are like the pre-requirements for this to work. But you can literally go kind of food by food and be like, oh, wow, raspberries, good, blueberries, bad. Um, you know, cauliflower, bad, uh, kale, good, you know, oh, look, uh, broccoli's bad too. And so and then you can start to ask, like, what is the dominant um, carbohydrate structure inside of these vegetables and these fruits? And that can lead you to some potential analysis about what enzymes you might be lacking, because there's no test out there that can tell us this. But in general, there are a whole bunch of people who can't do uh, like cabbage, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, all the cruciferous vegetables, which we know are like anti, they're like anti-inflammatory. They're like anti everything. They're really good for us. And we'd love to eat them, but they, they bloat us. And, and then we fart and it usually smells pretty bad. That is typically a alpha galactitase and a, and a cellulase deficiency, which are, which are often at the, the microbiome level. Your, your bugs are actually making those. Um, if you react to things like, uh, Poly, uh, polyphenols, that's, that's typically a xylanase issue. And so you can kind of begin to break this down um, where if you eat high fructose, high glucose and you, or, or sucrose type things and you bloat, that's sugar. 
um, you, you might have a SIBO or a candida infection at that point, because there's not a lot of enzymes needed for that. If you can't do starches, um, that's an enzyme issue usually at the top at the amylase level. And then the, the complex vegetable interactions are typically more at the microbiome level. When, um, there's a good question here from our anonymous attendee. Well, what about leaky gut when food is not broken down small enough and it does get across the border, the, the intestinal barrier because of permeability? So you, you were talking about how it needs, the molecules of the food need to be small enough to go across the border. But I think the language is a little bit confusing because it sounded like you were saying we had to have leaky gut, but we don't. It's just nope. about absorption, right? So the nutrients need to be absorbed. Correct. Yep. The so normal body function. Normal body function is the food, the, the nutrients go through your cells. Leaky gut is the food goes between your cells. Right on. Okay. That was great explanation. Thank you. Um, why are seed oils bad for the gut? I mean, they're just, they're just inflammatory in nature uh, by themselves. And uh, depending on what your beliefs are, and I don't think that this is figured out yet, but uh, in general, we do want to balance between omega-3s and omega-6s and omega-9s for for generalized health. Uh, we do get a decent amount of omega-6 and omega-9 just from living in the Western life and pouring extra um, like vegetable oils, rapeseed oil, those types of things into your body is probably not great. I personally have a belief that if you can't do it in your home, if you need like a, some special chemical process in a giant press to extract oil from something, then you know, that's, it's probably more risky on the food scale. Like even some of the new crazy cool milks, like, uh, like oat milks and things like that. You're like, how do, how do you milk an oat? I don't really know. Um, <laughs> there's uh, no, that's, the that's more really we process cool. things yeah. to have a Western lifestyle, the, the, the farther we get away from nature. Exactly. Guys, please put your questions in the, in the Q and a box. Cause that's much easier for me. And I get overwhelmed. Um, what I also wanted to find out is what kind of water do you drink, Steve? OJ wants to know, does chlorine in the water affect gut microbiome? What water system for the whole house would you recommend to get rid of the chlorine, fluoride, and basic toxins in U.S. water? And of course, that varies depending on where you live. Yeah, I, I mean, right now I'm drinking just natural spring water uh, that we get from the store at the moment. Um, there's definitely the possibility and probably the fact that the chlorine in the water, the chlorine in your pools everywhere is affecting your microbiome. Um, I tend not to choose to optimize my life for this, but if you have the possibility to install a whole house uh, water filter uh, with like a remineralization, I think that's, you know, more power to you. I wish I had that as well, um, but it's, it's just lower on my list of to do's because I want a resilient body. I don't want a, a fragile body. And by that, mean, that means I can only have like non-chlorinated water that's, you know, run through the chakras and I, I can't leave my house and go to the restaurant. So right. I like to travel. I like to see the world. So I try to minimize my exposure to it, but I don't fret over it. Right. It, it's a balance. It's, a, it's just such a balance. One other thing about um, seed oils is a lot of times they're rancid by the time we get them. So that's just like a baseline about seed oils, peanut butter, peanuts are often rancid by the time we get them. But that's all like such doom and gloom because to Steve's point, like you still wanna live, you still wanna be able to eat, you still wanna be able to you know, function. Um, there's a lot of controversy about distilled water oh, you know, versus not. And that's a whole nother webinar, you guys. So I wanted to stick to the, <laughs> yeah, to the, yeah. um, to the great questions. Um, but I wanted to, Lee's asking, you talk quickly through the different enzymes that break down different things. Do you have a resource that could recommend where we can find those lists and where the veggies food require which enzymes? So do you have a bottle of Holozyme there? Um, I do, yeah. So also Steve created this, this digestive enzyme to actually answer that. And he gave us a nice discount for today if you wanted to buy some, no pressure. Um, but Steve, why did you develop this and how did that happen? Um, if you click the link to that, that Siobhan has there on our, okay. on our page there on our, on our e-commerce store, um, if you scroll down to almost the bottom, it actually lists out what, what, what the foods and the enzymes do. Um, oh, cool. I want to do that on the label, but uh, the FDA does not allow it. Just, and just, just in case anybody doesn't know this, the label on the back of the bottle, that's not for you. 
that's to protect the supplement company because this is legal language. That's not health advice. So just a FYI for people who think that the back of the bottle tells them the whole story about uh, about how to use the product. I mean, it general it is generally good recommended uh, advice, but that's legal language. That's not health advice. Um, I created Holozyme because as a person who struggled with food and bloating and had to be on very restrictive diets for a long time, um, I want to, like I said, I want to travel. I want to eat out. I want to live my life. And I ended up using usually like two to three digest gold and like three Dipan nine at every meal. And if you add up the cost on that, it's like 150 or more dollars a month, just in enzymes. And it also didn't work all the time. I was very frustrated, especially like if I wanted to go out on a date or I wanted something special to happen and it wouldn't work. Then when I got Kalish trained at the Functional Medicine Institute, and then I saw people, I saw the exact same thing repeated over well over 300 uh, consulting cases. And this just annoys me. As, a, as an engineer, I need the highest return for the lowest amount of risk. And in like engineering school, like you can't have like, some percentage of bridges fail or tires fly off. And so I don't quite understand why in the medical community, there's not more uh, drive towards uh, products that work in a higher percentage of people. It's like they, they, they get half the science right, and then they just kind of like put it to market and they don't really keep going. Um, and so that's kind of what, what Healthy Gut is standing for. We want to make products that hopefully work for at least 70% of people who, who purchase them, which is actually, it might sound like crazy, but the truth is, is that that's a very high number in, in, in supplements uh, as well as drugs, actually, uh, not that it's a drug. But um, so I was just on a quest because my life got really stressful. Uh, Siobhan mentioned that, that for a while I got disillusioned with functional medicine and diet and supplements. And I was like, this stuff's all for the birds. It doesn't, it doesn't have the answer for my visceral hy hypersensitivity. And so I started coaching people, uh, business. And, and then I came back when I realized that my life was <laughs> like steering me back towards digestive health and I needed to handle this. And so Holozyme's really for me as well as it is for you. Um, and I basically just called around the world, everybody who makes enzymes, what's the difference? Why is your work? Um, I just decided to make one, uh, one bottle that was like triple everything on the market. And it was like $40, uh, per bottle. And it's still, the guy was like, I still don't think this is going to work, which is when I found a PhD who had a patent on why enzymes don't work. It's literally called an activation patent for enzymes. And what he found was just a base principle in biology that enzymes made vegetarian or vegan in the lab do not have the mineral they need to turn on work. Instead, it's just a chance dance inside of your gut if it finds the magnesium or the calcium or the zinc that it needs to work. And so anything like the, the creons, the pancreatins, the extracts from animals have the mineral with them. But all those brush water enzymes I mentioned, all the microbiome enzymes, anything that's not, a, not an extract from an animal does not have its mineral cofactor packaged in it. And so this was and is the reason why it's hit or miss. Like one day your product works and the other day it doesn't work. And, and um, so what he did was in a lab, sit there and drop the minerals in the, the Petri dishes with the enzyme codify that and, and make a patent on it. And he ran six studies on it. And so I licensed his patent and we redeveloped his formula to be heavily focused on these digestive issues that cause bloating and cause upset for myself and for, for a lot of other folks. So it's very different. This really fills a gap. Um, Michelle is saying, is there an amount of kelp listed in the enzymes? I have to keep my iodine low. I'm a person with Hashimoto's who can only take a little iodine. Yeah, it's 15 milligrams. And that's low. Yeah. And okay. it's standardized to 0.1% iodine. Okay. So that's 0. Uh, 0.15 milligrams okay. of iodine or 0. 0.015. Can we talk about the reliance on enzymes long-term? Carrie's asking about that. Carrie, uh, you know, and everyone, this isn't going to resolve your SIBO. If you have an overgrowth of Klebsiella or E. coli in your small intestine, then um, you, that's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If you have an overgrowth of RKI um, in your small intestine, then you have you know, intestinal methanogen overgrowth. So this is a tool to use 
in addition, and while you're figuring out your, you know, if you do have those things, some people take digestive enzymes and their bloat just goes away. God bless. Some people really have to do a multi-pronged approach, which is what I see um, a lot of you talking about with your, with your issues. And also our Facebook group, SIBO SOS um, community, there's, you know, 20, 2000 people in there all talking about this. So that's another support. And also if you do decide to go for some whole enzymes, I know Steve has a Facebook group for people there as well. Um, once you're, you know, a customer, it's great service after the sale too. So meaning that there's support. The thing is, is that if you, Carrie, if your digestive enzymes are being reduced due to age, that's one thing that's, you know, that's like gonna counteract that um, and doing it into perpetuity. Hopefully, you know, you get your, your enzyme mojo back, but it's not usual when you're getting older. I don't know how old you are. Um, that is so, uh, very typical with the decline of your body creating its own enzymes in the mess, what, modern world, Western diet, that kind of thing. Anyway. Um, and so also just to say like, I am hypersensitive to this question and I yeah. had the same question before I even brought a product to market. Uh, so I own books from the 1800s on digestion and anytime anybody has a theory about how taking extra enzymes might stop the own, uh, our own internal production of enzymes, I investigate it. I have not found even a credible theory, let alone a research paper or a book that actually mentions a mechanism on how that would happen. So at this point in time, there's still no theory um, or even idea on how this would work. Uh, and then as Siobhan mentioned, I don't know like, again, it depends on how old you are. Like if you're in your twenties and thirties, you don't really get this yet, but as you age, you'll be like, Oh, my eyesight's going, Oh, my ovaries and my testes are, are, are drying up. Oh, things are changing. And the same thing happens with your gut, unfortunately, like things that we just start shutting things down. What about people who are sensitive to mold and the enzymes, um, like aspergillus? Cause I know we've had this question before and, and yeah. I want to have you answer it. Cause, cause there, how does that show up on the bottle? Uh, is aspergillus well, if, is if your source? bottle does not say pancreatin, then it, then it came from a mold species. <laughs> That's how it shows up on the bottle. Okay. So in other words, the, almost the entire marketplace is made from the enzymes are given off by mold, not made from mold. And that's, oh, that's okay. the key understanding here. And so if this was actually a real issue, then you would not be the only one reacting. There'd be millions of people having issues and there's not. And the reason why is just a little fundamental misunderstanding about how this process works. If you go in the forest, you notice trees are decaying. How those trees are decaying is mold is on it. And then it gives off enzymes that decay the, 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 the cellulose and, and the, basically the stuff in the, in the tree below it. And then the mold eats the, the vitamins and nutrients that are released. In the lab, they basically construct certain types of molds that they want for certain enzymes like there's different molds that make proteases and you can do a bunch of different proteases. They basically just feed it the right um, like pH and the right uh, temperature and with the right um, food and the mold secretes enzymes. Then they filter that through like a bunch of filters and a whole crazy process. So the mold stays over in the mold area, but the enzymes end up over in the clean, you know, no bad stuff area. And so, um, Hopefully that makes sense. Is that, is that, did that make sense, Siobhan? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a, almost like a off-gassing process of the mold. It's a byproduct of the mold. It's not the mold, but right. I, it's a very understandable, like, totally. question. What, what do you suggest for people to take their enzymes with or after meals? Tracy's asking. Um, you can play with it based on our, you know, thousands and thousands of customer uh, interactions and feedback. There are some folks that do benefit from taking it right before the meal so that the, mm -hmm. the, basically the enzymes are in your stomach as the food hits your stomach. So if you're, if you're someone who's having a ton of bloating and you're really struggling, that might be the best bet for you. Um, for the majority of people, like 70% or more taking them right after your meal seems to be just fine. Um, okay. it, it, it's totally up to you. Uh, what do you think about bone broth for gut health, Sherry? Yeah, I mean, it's full of, it's full of minerals and glycine, um, you know, hopefully some collagen. So all those things are very important building blocks for the integrity 
of the gut. But if you have an enzyme deficiency or a stomach acid deficiency or a butyrate deficiency or a microbiome problem, bone broth's not going to help with any of those things. Uh, do you take a probiotic with your enzyme? Birdie is asking. I do. I take all my pills together all at the same time. Um, I don't buy that you cannot take probiotics with your meals. Um, I, I think that's a bit of a myth. Okay. Doreen is asking a question. Thanks for shortening it, Doreen, because I get overwhelmed because um, it's like too long to like read through and then um, get to the answer. Okay, what if I just can't avoid bloat? They're constantly and just gets worse with any food, only once in a while painful as I do take enzymes when I eat. Good for you. Any idea what to do next? I don't want to limit diet, been there and develop super sensitivity to so many things. Doreen, have you tested for parasites? We haven't talked about parasites today, Steve. And um, that also can lead to bloating. Ovarian cancer can lead to bloating. I mean, it's a symptom of something else, right? Not Yeah, we, we forgot to touch either. on this. Um, yeah, if you have a history of bloating and you've tried enzymes and you've tried many of these specialty diets and this history goes on many, many years, please go medically get your physical, uh, physical body checked out because there are people who are on these webinars who I will hear from in like a year from now, it is, this literally happens. It, it happens from some of the people from the SIBO SOS group who have even bought holozymes and I'm like, okay, double, triple your dose. It doesn't work. And I'm like, go to the doctor. And they have like something called double loop syndrome. They were born with a, with an issue. They, they're like, oh yeah, I did have surgery when I was a child. And they, they have like either um, issues with the healing process, or maybe the surgeon left honestly clips in there. Um, like you said, there could be a, a tumor growth. Like there are, there are real medical reasons for bloating that have nothing to do with food. And if your history is multi, multi years of this, and you have functional medicine testing saying I, you don't have SIBO and you've tried all these diets, please go get endoscopies, colonoscopies, uh, you know, CT scans, because ruling that out could save your life and could take care of your bloating. Well, there's that too, right? There's a side effect. Yeah. No, I'm, I don't mean to make light of that. It's so important. And we don't talk about that that much because um, it's, you know, I think it's a foregone conclusion that, you know, oh, we know you, you know, you have SIBO or, you know, IBS, which is SIBO. So um, I'm glad we're talking about the bigger picture. One thing to also keep in mind is that when you have adhesions that can pull your intestines, um, like with endometriosis, you can pull your intestines in different places in your body and sort of like tug on it. And so the migrating motor complex, which is the sweeping motion of the small intestine can't work as effectively, which can lead to SIBO, but and on and on. So if you're like, I, you know, I'm doing everything, do what Steve said and go find somebody, get a CAT scan if you need to, um, and so on. I, I don't want to take up any more time. Yeah. Sorry. One, one that. other question or one other uh -huh. thing you have to rule out if bloating is an issue for you and you haven't ruled it out is you have to do an HCL challenge. I don't even care if you do it with our HCL guard, do it with somebody's HCL because if you're holding the food inside your stomach for like extra hours, the fermentation could be happening there and, or you're going to be messing up your enzyme and speed pathways later in the small intestine, which will just almost automatically lead to bloating. So, and we also know that low stomach acid is like a massive risk factor for, for SIBO and SIBO overgrowth. So if you're trying to structure like, okay, I've, I've been doing the food, I've been doing the enzymes, step, step two would be like double, double your enzyme dose. I don't care what the brand is, see what happens for the next three days. That doesn't work. Um, and you've already done all these things. Uh, try an HCL challenge. What is an HCL challenge? Patty, P Patrick wants to know. Um, an HCL challenge is either you, you go to the website, you take, take the SIBO SOS coupon, get some HCL guard. You take one pill with a standard dinner. Usually that'll have some protein, at least 10 grams of animal or, or uh, vegetable protein. And you just wait and you see what happens. Um, if you do not have any like uh, tingling, burning heat sensations, then that means that you probably will benefit from some stomach acid replacement support. Um, about uh, Steven Sandberg Lewis said in a podcast, which I know you've had on the show and I love him. I, I think of him as a mentor of mine. Dr. Jonathan Wright has also published uh, publicly in his books data on this. They said that 70 to 85% of people reporting to their clinics with either heartburn or IBS like symptoms when they did a stomach acid test, which is like kind of a rare test that you can only do in certain doctor's offices. You have to pay out of pocket. It costs like $500. 
somewhere between 300 to 500, depending where you live. They said 70 to 85% of those people who had these nondescript bloating, heartburn, IBS would have low stomach acid. So there's a chance, there's 20% chance, you know, that you need to ask us for a refund. If you take that pill and then you feel some heat, some sensation, you drink some baking soda, you try it again the next day, same thing happens. You probably have just fine stomach acid. Like you're, you're probably okay. Um, there's like less than 1% of people have high acid. If you have high acid, of course, that will also cause some, some upset. Um, but it, that's extremely rare. Uh, so I wouldn't focus on that. Uh, do you have a supplier of Holozyme in the UK? Not right now, but we do ship uh, internationally still. And it's just what Steve said in the past is that the shipping's really high. So, you know, do the evaluation and see if, if you can pull that off. Um, we know, we know, Steve knows we're trying to take it global. I, I mean, I, I'm saying we, but if there's somebody, <laughs> I don't have anything to do with it, but he is trying to, to make it global. Um, so, but you know, a lot of companies won't even ship overseas, no matter what the postage is. Um, okay, we have to start wrapping up. Um, is he saying that enzymes and holozyme are animal derived or is he adds minerals that you make it like animal derived enzymes, Elizabeth? The uh, holozymes is a vegetarian and vegan safe formula. It is, uh, it is not animal derived. We add the minerals to make it like the animal derived ones. Okay. Um, is sauerkraut good or bad for us? It has probiotics in it, but it's high FODMAPs. Does sauerkraut make candida worse? I think sauerkraut is extremely good for you if you can tolerate it. Anything that you eat, no matter if I say it or Siobhan says it um, or anybody else says it, even your doctor tells you that you should eat X, Y, and Z and you eat it and it causes pain, you're, you're the responsible one. You're in control here. You say, hmm, I don't know. I don't like that one. I'm not going to eat yeah. that. But in general, there was a study that just came out on uh, taking inulin or eating more fermented foods uh, for, I think, 60 days. And it was like an uncontrolled dietary study. And the people who ate more fermented foods had better quality of life and had a better microbiome diversity than the people who just supplemented with inulin. So um, there is you know, a lot of reasons to eat fermented foods on a, on a regular basis if you can tolerate them. And you know, Summer Bach, who's a fermentologist who was in my very first SIBO SOS summit, she had people really clear their SIBO first, wait till their gut healed, and then um, got into very small amounts of fermented food, as in like a half a teaspoon of sauerkraut juice and build yeah. up. So I have a girlfriend who has had SIBO and she could eat garlic, right? So it's everybody is different. Like if I ate some garlic during a SIBO flare, I would just be like, Diane. Um, I just want to answer this question and then I, cause I have another session I have to get to. Um, so well, this one's not a full hour, sorry, but para wellness is a, um, this has to do with parasites. Para wellness is a lab. Is, is it a lab? It's, it's this hybrid that's in Colorado and is a wonderful place to find out if you have, um, parasites. So just go to their site, check it out. Right. Um, he was a parasitologist for the military. Then what I've also heard like from our incredible Dr. Alana Gervich, she really loves GI map because GI map shows not only um, parasites, but also other pathogens that are in your stool. So uh, if you go to LabCorp or you go to Quest Labs, which is in the United States, the like most mainstream labs and you do an OVA, par uh, par what is it? A PO test? What is it? It's like the eggs of the parasite test. Uh, there's initials on it. Uh, an O&P test. Right. If it is positive, it is positive. If it is negative, it is not necessarily negative because it is not very sensitive. That test is not sensitive. Um, so if you got it, you got it. But if it's a no, and a lot of times insurance will pay for that, please continue to figure it out. Um, the first one was para wellness, um, para wellness, P-A-R-A -A, wellness. Um, the name of the lab in Colorado is para wellness. I don't, they don't know me. I've been a client of theirs in the past. They found stuff that no one else found, et cetera. Um, okay. And then what's so cool is let's say you showed high for blasto or whatever. Um, you do a treatment, you can send them another sample as a retest and it's less expensive. So I'm gonna keep going here. Steve, um, you just, wait, I just had a question here about, uh, what's the difference between Holozyme and HCL guard? So 
Yeah, so so holozymes is for the small intestine mainly, and it's gonna gonna help you with those missing enzymes or the ones that aren't working. And HDL guard is stomach acid support. So it's got a prokinetic in organic ginger and DGL to help heal your your stomach lining any mucosal issues. And then it has uh, pepsin intrinsic factor, which is needed for B12, and then HCL in it. So it is a it's stomach support and then small intestine support. That's kind of how our our lineup is created. So um, Susie just asked if I have, um, if I still have SIBO after six months, should I think about doing a, para, a parasite test? First of all, this isn't medical advice, okay? This is my experience as a health um, advocate and just a patient. The thing is, is that you really want to get that negative SIBO breath test. That's real, get that load down. <laughs> Come take the SIBO recovery roadmap with us. The course that Dr. Seebecker created with me, whatever, get that bacterial load down. And then you can really work on healing the gut. If you still have symptoms after you've, yep, I don't have SIBO, but I still have symptoms. Is it candida? Is it a parasite? But don't stop retesting for SIBO guys. Don't quit before that miracle because it can still be positive, but you could still have the bacterial load come down after treatments. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, can HCL guard be open? The answer to that is no, right? Nope. You can, you can sprinkle whole enzymes. You can't open HCL. Okay. Um, yeah, I, you know, we got to go, we can, I guess we should do another one on this, but, um, look, if you're, if you're listening to these webinars and you're trying to figure this out and you're totally confused now, you're like, Oh God, this, now I got to buy this guy's stuff. And now she's talking about this. I would just stop and take everything yeah. out. So some people are bloated because they're taking a probiotic. Some people are bloated because they are eating sauerkraut. So some of the best things you can do is something called a pill stop. And I want to be the company that, that makes supplements and tells you not to take them. Stop taking all your pills for a week, unless your doctor tells you, you can't, Obviously, I'm not a doctor. Do your own thing. Be responsible for your, yourself. But it's called a pill stop. Stop it for a week and then slowly add them back in. And you might find that that probiotic that seemed really good a few months ago is actually really bad for you. Um, that is a very common thing to find out when it comes to bloating. Um, and yes, if your SIBO keeps coming back, it's not the SIBO, it's something else. So check your stomach acid, check the parasites, check your hormones, You know, get the CT scan, make sure you don't have double loop or something else. And, and also, you know, right, to Steve's point, you, you want to find out why the SIBO is there to begin with. So we always talk about finding that underlying cause. Okay, please pop some love into the chat for Steve. Um, Steve and I have a plan to do more of these throughout the year. And one other thing is that um, it is $15 off for the formulations. It's one fifteen dollars off, I think. Whatever, it's a savings go to the, the links and it's taken at the end because sometimes we get emails and someone just asks, um, what's the coupon? Don't worry about that. I know I, also, I do a lot of coupons because like I'm like twisting people's arms all the time to get deals for my community, but it's already built in. Just go down when you're checking out the discounts taken there. Um, so, all right. Anything else, Steve, that we can think of in just this last minute? No, thank you so much for having us on. If, if you guys want more of this, you know, Siobhan's always like, hey, do you want to come and talk? What do you want to talk about? So if, yeah. if you guys as the community want more on bloating, if we didn't go deep enough on certain topics, just make a lot of noise in the Facebook group, in the SIBO SOS Facebook group, or- Don't do that. Okay, just don't do that. email me at info at SIBOSOS.com. <laughs> All right, in, email her at info at SIBOSOS.com and say, make Steve talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you at SIBOSOS.com. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Rosalind. That's great. I love talking to Steve. I love having you all here. Um, on, let's see, what's today? M March 28th. Holy smackers. Holy smackers. On Wednesday, do you know Nadine Artemis, uh, Steve? She no. has uh, Living Libations. She's my next webinar. We're really loaded up this month. And she um, is an amazing beauty. She has all of these Lux oils and um, uh, beauty products, but also holistic dental products. And I was oh, a longtime cool. customer of hers before I met her. And she was one of the leading um, speakers in the Dental Health Connection Summit. And so anyway, see you guys on Wednesday for Nadine. We'll send you an email. Uh, Claire says, I always learn from Steve. Me too. Thanks, Doriana. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And we'll send you out a replay. And we'll also, well, we're streaming live to the Facebook right now. Okay. Thank you. Talk Thanks to you later. Everyone. Bye, Steve. Thank you.